We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 52, beginning. If you want to get out your Bibles and turn to Isaiah 52. So good to, to see you here. We do have visitors here. We want you to know you're especially welcome. I uh, hope that the things that I've prepared this morning will be understandable and easy uh, for everyone here. We're going to be uh, talking about the gospel again this morning. I've been doing the series throughout the year once a month to uh, talk about the gospel and, and look at a specific text that revolves around the gospel. Uh, and Last month we started looking at texts from the Old Testament. And if I were to ask you what, what text from the Old Testament gives us the gospel, I don't know that there is a better text than the one that we're going to be studying from uh, this, this morning. In fact, it is the one that was even uh, mentioned in the Lord's Supper talk, and, and it's often mentioned in the Lord's Supper talk uh, because of its relevance to us as Christians. There's not many places uh, in the New Testament that tell us uh, exactly what we read and we study here in Isaiah. But notice what it says, first of all, in, in Isaiah 52, uh, read verse 7 with me. It says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. These words uh, in this verse, and this may not be a verse that you're very familiar with or that you've listened to on multiple occasions, uh, but these words in this verse are pointing to the gospel and the words that they say, the good news, bringing good news. And you could just imagine uh, a messenger coming and bringing good news through, through all the cities and all the towns, and that's exactly what we, we looked at uh, earlier in the year. That's what gospel was really pointing to, the good news that a king has conquered uh, that your, your king is reigning and ruling and, and defeating your enemies. It's good news. And notice here, it publishes, they publish salvation. They write for everyone to hear and for everyone to know that, that there's salvation from the enemy, that your God reigns. That is the gospel. A lot of times we think about the gospel, we think, well, the gospel is that Jesus has died for the forgiveness of our sins. And certainly that's true. But another way to put that is to say, your God reigns. That's fascinating, isn't it? Why is it that uh, that, that would also be the gospel, to say, your God reigns? That's the good news. What does that have to do with us? You know what? Why is it important that God reigns and, and that he is the, the, the king of kings? Well, it's important because up until the point that he showed this to everyone, it was not 100% believed or understood. And even after he showed it, people don't believe it, but it's, it's completely believable now. It's completely understandable now. And that's exactly what the point is of uh, what we're going to read about and study about today, is that God has shown it very clearly he is in control. He is the one of power. He is the one who we should be trusting in and relying on for our salvation. He does this, he explains this by describing to us his servant. If you go down in chapter 52 to verse 13, you'll notice a description of how God is reigning is given to us by talking about his arm or his servant. Let's read this together. Starting in verse 13, we'll read through chapter 53, verse 3. It says, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. 
He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. In this text, what we have is a description of God's servant. That's exactly what he's trying to get across to us. He says, behold, my servant. And then he he talks about his servant. He shall act wisely. He will be high and lifted up. He is the arm of the Lord being revealed. There's all these wonderful pictures of the servant. But there's some very fascinating truths about the servant in this text. He tells us that his appearance is so marred beyond human semblance. You can't even tell if he's human or not. He's he's disfigured. He's he's ugly. He's he's not as he should be. He's not he's not right. Something's wrong with him. And it's it's kind of fascinating that God would put forward the servant and then say, This is my servant. This is the arm of the Lord. I'm gonna exalt him, and then tell us he doesn't look right. His appearance is is wrong, it's marred, it's it's messed up. Later on, he'd, he'd say uh, that he's as one he's as one from whom men hide their faces. Verse three. My kids and I were watching the the movie Wonder. I don't know if you've seen that movie, but it's kind of that kind of a picture of a disfigured uh, little boy with a disfigured face, and and nobody will look at him. I mean, they, they don't or they stare at him. I mean, they don't they don't feel comfortable around him. And that's kind of the picture he gives us of of. The servant. (coughs) Then he says, he's like a young plant or a root out of dry ground. Think about those images for a second. A young plant is is weak and vulnerable. It's not a mighty oak. You know, it's not a strong tree that, that you might expect from God's servant. It's a young plant. It's something that you could crush easily. And he says, like a root out of dry ground. What is that about? Well, there's a picture throughout the Old Testament that when the Messiah comes, he's going to come into a desert, a wilderness. And here you have a root coming up out of dry ground. It's like, well, surely it's dead, right? I mean, everything's dead. But the picture he's giving for us is that he is the little hope of life. Though he is vulnerable, though he is weak, though he is nothing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then it says, he was despised and rejected. All those around him who saw him did not see majesty. <clears throat> Man, I've got a cough drop. It's not working. They did not see majesty. They did not see beauty. They did not desire him. He's not like uh, the, the, the picture model. He's the opposite. <coughs> so they, they didn't want anything to do with him. As you read through that, you're forced to ask yourself, how could someone like that be God's servant who he would exalt, who he would lift up, as an example for everybody else. It just doesn't make sense, does it? Well, that's the description of the servant that God is going to lift up. Next, he goes into a description of what this servant will will do. (coughs) Oh, man, I got a tickle and it's just killing me. Sorry. Verse 4 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers 
is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. (coughs) And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit. In his mouth. (coughs) Man. I'm sorry guys. Let me get some more water. Notice in this text. That there's a description of what. This servant will do. It says he, he has borne. Our griefs. And carried our sorrows. Doesn't that sound wonderful? Doesn't that sound like something. You would want a servant of God to do? carry your sorrows away from you, to carry your griefs away from you. That's a picture of what Jesus does. He's like a donkey that takes this huge heavy load that's on our back and he he puts it on his own and, and he carries it away and he gets rid of it so that we don't have to deal with it anymore. It says he did this by being pierced, by being crushed, by being chastised, by being wounded. And he did this, it says, for our transgressions. This is what the servant does. And as we read through this, we notice the contrast between what it says about the servant and what it says about us. (coughs) Oh, man, I went through a whole Bible class and couldn't didn't have any issue all right it says that we were the ones who oppressed him we oppressed him we judged him we are the ones who pierced him we are the ones who crushed him we are the ones who chastised him we are the ones who wounded him why did we do that it says because we esteemed him stricken Smitten by God and afflicted. (coughs) He says, we, like sheep, have gone astray. What a contrast that is. A picture of God's servant being someone who is good and who is loved and who is doing something good for us. And then the opposite picture of us oppressing him and bringing a judgment against him that is unjust because he has done nothing wrong, nothing deserving of the horrible treatment that we have, we have done. We, like str- sheep, have gone astray. We've turned aside to our own way. And God laid on him the iniquity of us all. Then it asked the question, who considered? Who considered? That he would be the one. Who considered that he would be the one who would make atonement for our sins? As we continue, we kind of wonder, why would anybody do that? Why would anybody suffer like that? Why would anybody uh, allow themselves to be treated so shamefully? Read verse 10. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and, his, and, he, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Notice he says it was God's will. The servant was willing to endure the suffering 
because he understood it was the will of God to crush him. Now, that doesn't sound right, does it? Again, there's some, there's some odd things in this text. Why would God want to crush his servant? <coughs> but the answer is, in the next line, when his soul makes an offering for guilt. God sent his servant, and his will was for that servant to be crushed by sinful men who thought that he was despised, who thought that God didn't love him, so that he could then make an offering for guilt. And then, after we see that he makes an offering for guilt, we see he has an offspring. We see that he is satisfied, that he's able to make many righteous And that he receives a spoil and then he shares that spoil with everyone who is strong. And he makes intercessions for all those who are transgressing against him. So the picture at the end of this is not really a picture of sadness, but a picture of hope. And understanding that, yes, God was willing to to let his servant be crushed. Because he had this picture of hope that was on the other side of that. And even the servant himself understood that after this period of crushing and persecution and and death, that he would rise from that. And from that, he would be able to make an offering and provide for all of God's people. To make, make it possible for them to be righteous, for them to be his offspring, for them to share in the spoil and the riches and to have a relationship with God. This is a beautiful picture that I botched with coughing, but it's a beautiful picture of God's servant who is willing to do what no one else would do in order to accomplish what no one else could accomplish for us. So, as we look in the Old Testament, we need to understand there are pictures of the gospel. And this is one of them, one of the greatest, that God reveals his reign by exalting his servant and by humbling his people to provide for them. See, the servant was able to uniquely equip all of those who were transgressors. Look at verse 11 again. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Notice, by his knowledge shall the righteous one make many to be accounted righteous. You see, the servant was uniquely equipped to provide an understanding of righteousness for God's people. And so as we read this uh, text in Isaiah We're not just reading the gospel. We're learning about how the Messiah, the servant, is going to equip God's people. Jesus is going to perfectly fit this description for us. Jesus is going to line up perfectly with all the things that are said here. He will be despised and rejected as he carries our sorrows and carries our griefs. We see him taking away the sicknesses of men, taking away the demon possession, uh, removing those burdens and providing for the people. We see him submitting perfectly to the will of God with this understanding that God would provide the offering that's needed through his sacrifice. And Jesus knew that by accomplishing this, God would be able to make it possible for all of us to enjoy the hope of heaven when our lives are over. So, as we look at all those who are, who are in this text who despised and rejected Jesus, all those who pierced him and, and considered him evil or considered him uh, a blasphemer, which is very much what happened just as the text reveals to us, All those who didn't even consider that it was possible that he could have been the Messiah. That he could provide the spiritual blessings 
that God had promised through Isaiah. We need to ask ourselves, are we going to consider Jesus today? That's the gospel. Most, most people will follow their own way. Right? They'll, they'll be like sheep that are astray. Right? They'll be vulnerable. They'll be out there for the wolves to devour. But he has died to bring them in. To help them to see that he makes intercession for them. He makes intercession for all who will submit to him. So the application of this text is the application of the gospel. Do you see? Do you understand? Do you know? That salvation is made possible not through uh, a president or through some majestic uh, person who on YouTube tells you everything that you ever need to know or on TV or whatever. It's not through some celebrity or some beautiful person who gives you the keys of life. It's not about that. It's about the humble servant that came and that died and that today is widely ignored. Will you consider him? Will you become his offspring? Will you accept the life that he lived for yourself? Really, ultimately, this this text is not just telling us about what Jesus did as though we should just look at him and say, yeah, I believe he did it and I'm so glad he did it. But it's trying to give us an example so that we could follow in his steps. You see, the truth is, what we read about Jesus as God's servant in this text is the same thing that God wants to provide for us, and he wants us to follow. He doesn't want us to be beautiful and and majestic and to stick out as a physical specimen. It's funny how all these movies, you kind of have Jesus depicted as this, you know, supermodel, and I kind of wonder if it's like, they're just confused. Like, the beauty of Jesus is on the inside. It's definitely not about the outside. And that's exactly what we're supposed to be like. We're supposed to focus on the inside. We're supposed to be beautiful from within, even though the world around us despises and rejects us. Peter said it like this, quoting from Isaiah 53. For to this you've been called, because Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you've been healed, for, we were, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. You read this text, you see our life is not supposed to be about this world. It's supposed to be resembling the life of the servant who we read about in Isaiah 53. I think too many times I've read Isaiah 53 and I've just been blown away by how wonderful Jesus is and how how great the sacrifice was, which it's easy to just stop there. But it's not just a picture for us to admire him. It's also a picture for us to follow. We're here to be his offspring. We're here to have sacrificial service that resembles the life of of our Lord and Savior. And if you're here this morning and you're not doing that, as a, as a child of God, remember the words of Peter. We, like sheep, have gone astray. But he has come to bring us into the fold. He's come to bless us. And he desires for us to be like him. If you paid attention through all of my coughing and everything, thank you so much. Um, you were able to look past the weakness of my flesh and uh, hopefully get the message of the text. If you're here this morning and you've not submitted your life to Christ, why not? It's a beautiful picture that we have in Isaiah 700 years before Jesus came, describing in detail exactly what Jesus would come and do. 
There's no doubt. God reigns. God is in control. God has power over the kingdoms of earth. God has power over everything. And he brings everything about in order to accomplish his will. And that's exactly what he did on the cross for you and me. If you haven't accepted his grace and his mercy, we want to help you in any way that we can. If you have accepted it and you're not living a life of sacrificial service, you're not living a life as a servant of God, then I hope that these words in Isaiah 53, as we read them many times, maybe in the next year at Lord's Supper, will remind you we're not here for ourselves. We're here to serve others. If there's anything that we can do for you today, will you please come as we stand and as we sing?